You know, as many of you know, customer service is a passion with us at Amdahl. It's something that we spend a lot of energy on. It's something that we work very, very hard on. And I've often said that customer service is an attitude. It's a state of mind. It's a willingness to listen, to be involved, and to be open-minded. The next speaker brings a very unique perspective to customer service. I think you'll enjoy hearing about customer service in a way and in a place that wouldn't automatically come to mind when you talk about great customer service. I was delighted when I heard that Stu Leonard Jr. was going to be on this program because I have a very personal experience with what customer service means and in particular what it means at Stu Leonard's. In 1978, I moved my family, five children, from Michigan to Connecticut. Kids were fairly young, and as all, any of you who have had moves know, it's a very traumatic experience. And so late on a Sunday night, the movers had left. Everybody was tired and a little cranky. And we, sweat out, we set out to get some food to stock our home. We asked our neighbors where we should go, and we were told we should go to Stu Leonard's. And so we walked in, everybody a little irritable, trying to get some food. And I, was, I set about trying to get an out-of-town check accepted since I had a very limited amount of cash. And as I stood discussing it with the uh, cashier, I noticed a man standing behind her. He walked over and introduced himself, and it happened to be Stu Leonard Sr. He welcomed me to Connecticut. He welcomed me to Westport, the neighborhood in which he lived. And he welcomed me to Stu Leonard's and hoped that I'd be very, very happy in this recent move. When I turned back to the cashier to ask if that meant that they would accept my out-of-town check, she said, oh, Mr. Zemke, don't worry about it. Mr. Leonard has picked up your bill. Welcome to Stu Leonard's. Welcome to Westport. This was about 9 o'clock on a Sunday evening. And it was very clear to me why Stu Leonard's had a focus on customer service. It started with Stu Leonard himself. It's a terrific story. It's one that you'll enjoy. And there's food for thought for all of us because customer service is a state of mind and it is an attitude. I hope you enjoy listening to Stu Leonard as much as I enjoyed experiencing what good customer service means. I know customer service is real important, um, you know, but we want to keep building sales. I mean, you, you want to take customers away from IBM. We're uh, pretty much a small fish when it comes to these big chains around the country. Uh, Multi-billion dollar chains are all around our store, and we're fighting the big guys all the time. And one of the ways we do it, we have this big road sign. It's 35 feet high. It's an electronic, computerized road sign. We can change whatever we want. Uh, we see one of the competitors comes out with something in their ad, boom, 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 we can go in and, and beat them by a dime on it, you know? Like, like that, you know? <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so um, we fight for what items get to go on this sign because it does dramatic things. We're at the US Route 1 and customers milk 95 cents, wow, they pull right in. So, so anyway, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> You're probably saying 95 cents? Do companies sell things for 95 cents? <laughs> um, <laughs> I, hey, <laughs> Joe said that we're in a different business, you know? <laughs> uh, you know, computers get you excited, milk gets me excited, you know? <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> now, when I heard I was coming here today, um, and I was talking to our managers, I was telling them, I was reading, tell, reading, telling them about, you guys started at the same time we did, you're billions of dollars, we're, we're like probably 150 million now this year, saying, wow, look at, boy, they exploded. And we're saying, what could we do special for all of you today? And, and you know, boy, there's 750 people, I mean, you can't bring cookies down you know, with us. <laughs> So we, we came up with an idea, and what we decided to do was change the road sign, and I'll show you what we put up instead of the milk. <laughs> hey, you know, I don't want to blow out your candle, but, uh, <laughs> you know, as soon as we took this 
Uh, picture. <laughs> Milk, 95 cents a half gallon, we're right back up. <laughs> you know, we don't love you that much. <laughs> uh, this was our business back in, in the, really the 50s, 60s here. This is a picture in the 60s. It's, um, we're home, we just delivered milk. Now one of the things we did was we had cow heads on the front of all the milk truck. <laughs> our slogan back then was, you wave, I'll moo. You know? <laughs> and the kids, you know, they would run out and wave to the little cow on the front of the truck. And when they waved, the driver had a lever like this that he would pull in the truck. And out of the grill would come a moo, <laughs> like that. And this little business was going along great right here. We were doing fine. I grew up right behind it. I used to come and help work over here as a kid, washing milk cans, you know, and cleaning the old milk tanks out and everything. And it was fun just to work with my dad. I, I liked it. And I thought I was going to be a milkman. That's really what I dreamed. And, and the business was going along fine. And, and then um, a couple things happened in the 60s, which was where... The customers, my father started hearing from some customers, they said, you know, we've been with you for a long time, but, you know, we can't afford having milk delivered to our house anymore. Uh, we're going to start picking it up at these, you know, milk jug stores and convenience stores and supermarkets that were opening like crazy in our town. And so my father's working at building his little family business, and then one day there's a knock on the door from the state of Connecticut, and they said, we're building a new highway right through this dairy. And you have to move, you know. That's what you call motivation right there. <laughs> and my father didn't know what to do. He really didn't know what to do. And, and um, uh, he went up to one of his professors, an older fellow up at University of Connecticut, he, who my dad studied agricultural science uh, from. And he said, Stu, do you love the milk business? And my father said, yeah. He said, then stay in it. Don't go to another business. Do what you love. And so my father came down and he said, I love the milk business and, and he sold these eight items. So he went and borrowed $482,000 from the Small Business Administration and, and also uh, about three, 400000 from local banks, small local community banks. And in 1969, he opened up a small dairy. Now, but before I get to that, I just want to me mention one thing, that he also believed in motivating people. Even though he had 10 people here, he, he believed in motivation. You see down in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen there, there's a bumper of a car. If one of his people did an outstanding job, they got to take home the company car. And I'll show you what, what, what that looks like. This, this is a picture of it right here. <laughs> 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 and that went moo too. <laughs> now in 1969, with everything on the line, he opened this little store up right here. This is, uh, was, was uh, a small dairy store. He sold eight items in it. Most supermarkets uh, today sell over 25,000. Everybody who walked in said, this place will be out of business w within six months. You know what's funny was as they were saying that, you know what my dad did? He hung something on the front door of the store, and it was a sign that said, we want you happy. Anytime you're not 100% satisfied, I'll refund your money quick as a flash. And he hung this sign up. Now here he has huge debt. Everybody's telling him he's going to go out of business. And he hangs that sign up at the front door. The banker even told him to take it down. <laughs> he couldn't afford to run a business that way, but he did. And within 15 miles of this store, there were n over 90 stores that also sold food. Joe could have gone to another 90 stores to buy the same things he bought at Stu Leonard's that night. And the only mission my father wanted was that he wanted people leaving to be happy. When they dealt with Stu Leonard's, they were going to be happy. Uh, he also built a bottle and plant right in the middle, glass window. You could watch the milk being bottled. So there was a, a philosophy then. We didn't really talk about it because we didn't know it, but it was quality. We wanted the freshest, the best products you could buy in that store. The other thing was that nice people. 
I mean, you know, you know how you go up to a cash register, you want somebody polite who like is, is happy that you came to visit. And so those were really three things he wanted bad, you know, and he worked on. And slowly more customers started coming in and, and more and more and more. And, and uh, even though he didn't, he, he, was, he was behind the eight ball and, and, and you know, he had to learn how to talk, call the suppliers and say, could you give me a few extra days to pay you because I, you know, I'm still building a business and the suppliers said, okay. And they helped him out and, and gave him a, a little more credit. He was still doing things like he did for Joe. Thanks for coming. You know, we appreciate it. Welcome to the town. That was the whole philosophy of the business. Over the last uh, 23 years that we've been open now, in this one store, we put 26 additions on. That's why I was not asked, but told not to say a thing about strategic planning. <laughs> 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 now, my job as now as the next generation is, is how do you get, we have 1,200 people now between both stores, how do you get everybody, every minute that you're open, to want to go crazy over the customer, who, who, who look at the long-term picture and say, we'll do whatever you want, we'll, we'll, we'll do whatever you want to make you happy. And that's really what the idea that, that um, we want to do, and, and we, we just took now, and our family, you know, which is, which is this is, uh, my mom's not in the picture here, but this is pretty much, I work with my two sisters, uh, Beth and Jill, my brother Tommy, who's on the left side of the screen. Tommy just went up and opened the second store up. My dad's uh, pretty much retired now. Uh, next to him is my sister Jill, who handles all our people and personnel and human resource at the store. She also started a little university, Stu Leonard University, uh, where different companies and and things come in, and, and, and she runs that thing uh, at the store. Um, and we start getting like 10,000 people a, a year visit, you know, from all over the world. And so, you know, we, we actually, it started a, a Japanese uh, group of about 12 people wanted a tour of the store. And it was right coming up on uh, uh, a holiday. And we wrote them back. We said, look, I'm sorry, we, you know, we can't give you a tour. We can't spend the... They wrote back, we would love a tour, please. We'd love you to spend two, three hours with us. We, we said, I'm sorry. I mean, we, we just can't. I, I'd love to help you. But, and and uh, they wrote back, said, we really want to come. Give us a time that's most convenient. So you know what we did? We figured just to quiet them down, we made up a little brochure on this university. We called it Stu Leonard's University. And you know, we put like $300 a person on it. And, and we figured, uh, you know, we'll just send this brochure we had the art department do it up you know we have we, we just wrote we said look we, we have this little university at, at the store you know and this is it and figured who's gonna want to come from Japan you know over to go through this thing they wrote back said we'd love to come <laughs> to my sisters boy I better get this curriculum together you know real quick <laughs> uh, <laughs> so so that was the beginning of that and my dad's in the middle there. Uh, my sister Beth went to France. Uh, she has her master's in French. I know there's some people from France here. And one of the requirements for Middlebury College was she had to live in France for a year. So she goes over and she, they, she has to live with a native French family. The family she was randomly assigned to live with were, were bakers. They had a boulangerie outside of Paris. Every morning at like three, the family would wake up together go downstairs to their little store and make baguettes and French butter croissants. My sister went and helped. And, and she gets all done with, with uh, college and she has her master's in French. And when she came back to the state, she learned a valuable lesson that, you know, there's not a big market if you have a master's in French, you know. <laughs> so, uh, she, <laughs> She came in and, and one day and she said, you know what, I'd like to start making these French butter croissants in the store. You know, this is like in the, in the you know, in 77, like we're sitting there, you know, what are they, Beth, you know? And, and, and we figured it was a little burst of enthusiasm. It would last like three months. So we took a, a, a literally a used pizza oven that we, we got at an auction and like hot wired it over in a corner of the store. <clears throat> We put her there, you know, with the flour, the mixers, the dough, the butter, all that. 
And, and she started to mix and fold and roll by hand and make these little French butter croissants, just like she learned in France, and put them out on a little counter right in the store hot in white bags. And customers started buying these like unbelievable. It, it started growing. She needed more help and more help. Today, in, in her bakery in Norwalk, she has about 90 people working in it. You know? and, and she... <laughs> <laughs> and it, it's it's called Bethy's Bakery, you know, and and uh, she's added muffins and croissants, and, I mean uh, cookies, and and she listens to the customers. What do they want? Fat-free muffins? Okay, we'll put some fat-free. And so she's been building this business. She she opened up a uh, another one up in Danbury in the store. We risked it all again. We put it all on the, all the chips. Boom! Let's go. Let's you know roll the dice. It's like everybody's watching to say, can they do it in the second store? And um, uh, what happened, we didn't realize, was all the chain competitors up in that area, they said, Stu Leonard's is coming to town. They took, uh, um, and they took their best store managers in the country, in the chains. Guess where they moved them? Into this market. They all remodeled before we opened, and they all, just lowered all their prices to match ours. So really, um, uh, price is no longer an issue in this market. We have to win this business through quality, uh, through uh, better product on the shelf, through friendly people, through cleaner stores, to attention to the details. We have a change in market right now. We have these wholesale clubs opening. I know all over the country, Price Club, Sam's Wholesale Club, which Sam Walton uh, started, there's Pace Food Warehouse, there's BJ's Wholesale, which is opening around us. There's Costco Food Warehouses. Um, uh, pretty much you're trying to take the cutthroat, low price food business. Very little service, uh, big warehouse, pallet racks. And what our job is, is to learn what their customers think about their store better than they know. So we're Learn, we're trying to all the time listen be, you know, to the customers as much as we can. What can we do to make Stu Leonard's better? That's what we have to keep listening in order to compete with people like this. What we do is we really try to get on the floor and, and, and we have a suggestion box, we do focus groups and we listen to what are these people saying walking through our store? What do they want? What don't they want? And we try to react and, and, and change. So that when it's all done, they're happy. And if they're happy, they come back. We have uh, at Stu Leonard's a, a rock at our front door, and it has our only policy on it. And this policy came up when my dad first opened the door of that little tiny store in 1969. A lady walks in and walks up to my dad and says, I don't like this eggnog. I want my money back. Uh, he said, ma'am, there's nothing wrong with it. And he, he went to hand it back to her. She started getting madder. And she said, I don't like the eggnog. I want my money back. So my father took it and he said, well, what's wrong with it? She said, it doesn't taste right. Barry Blardinelli, the manager of the store, was standing next to him. They took a few cups and tasted the eggnog, handed it back and said, ma'am, it might be a little spicy, but there's nothing wrong with this eggnog. She flew into a rage. And when my father saw that, he quick reached in his pocket, took a dollar bill out, which is how much eggnog cost then, handed it to her. She took three steps away and flailed the dollar bill and said, I'm never coming back to this store again, and left. You now my father's sitting there looking at Barry. He said, you know, we're, we're trying to build this business. We're trying to get customers. He said, something's wrong here. He said, you know what, Barry? He said, let's set up a policy now at the store that we are only going to lose the dollar and never lose the customer. And <laughs> and so that, that was the birth of a 6,000 pound rock that's at our front door. We chiseled in stone our policy on it. And this is at rule one, the customer is always right. The customer is always right. And we came up with rule two, drive it home. The customer's ever wrong, reread rule number one. You know? <clears throat> <laughs>
You know what? A customer called me up. We came out with a new sourdough bread, European style with the hard crust. You know, a, a, a real good San Francisco type sourdough. Customer writes me a letter and, and just uh, last week, and she, she says to me, you know your philosophy, the customer's always right. She said, well, I bought some of your sourdough bread. I didn't know it was the crusty, good European type crust. She said, and I bit into it. She said, cracked my tooth. Attached is a thousand dollar dental bill. And she also cut an article out that was written on Stu Leonard's and highlighted the part that said, the customer's always right. You know, nah, it really drives it home. <laughs> I called her up and one of the things we talk about at the store, if you ever have a customer complaint, always ask one question first, what can I do to make you happy? Usually it's less than what you plan on giving them. So, <laughs> right? <clears throat> so anyway, um, I called her up. She had cooled down a little bit. And I said, you know, we don't have insurance for this type of thing. Uh, but what can I do to make you happy? She said, well, look, she said, my, my insurance will only pay $550 of the thousand. She said, so I'm going to have a $450 bill. And I said, ma'am, I'll tell you what. I said, if we split it, would you be happy? And she said, yeah. You know, and she said, also, I had to get some something else for $28.85. She said, would you pay that too? So I said, sure. You know, hung the phone up. It was like $250 or something like that. And we sent her a check for $250. So she's happy. The reason we do that at the store is that we figured it out that a customer of ours spends $100 every week coming shopping. It's like they spend $100 a week. Joe's family would have spent more is with five kids. We add that up over a year, that's $5,000 plus. And then we said, let's not look at a customer as like one sale. Let's look at them like a 10-year investment. Like we want Joe's family coming for 10 years every week to Stu Leonard. We said, you know, that's over $50,000 they'll spend. So what we talk about at the store and believe is when we see a customer in the store with a shopping cart, we envision that on their forehead and magic marker is a big $50,000 <laughs> written right there. <you> know? <laughs> and if we can keep them happy, they'll keep coming back over and over and over and over again uh, at the store. Um, one of the challenges really I have is how do you, how do you like empower your people like, let's say my dad wasn't there at 10 o'clock at night when Joe came in. What happens? You know, you don't want to have some policy written. You can't do that. You have to let your people use their best judgment. And that's what we talk about at the store with our people. Use your best judgment when it comes to a customer. There's no rules. Just make sure they leave happy. They may mess up once or twice, but overall, you know, their judgment is good. Here's something that happened to me. This is a tuna fish sandwich we make at this store. One of my favorite lunches right here. Um, if I have to run up to the Danbury store, I usually leave, I go to Norwalk in the morning and I'll leave by lunchtime, drive up to Danbury, and I grab one of these sandwiches off our shelves. We bake the rolls fresh in the bakery, mix the tuna fish in the deli and make these sandwiches. We sell thousands of them a week. And I'm eating a tuna fish sandwich on the way to Danbury one day, and I'm, I look over and I see these two packets of Hellman's mayonnaise included in with the sandwich. And I'm thinking to myself, I said, you know, why are we including mayonnaise with an already mixed tuna fish sandwich? I mean, I never add more mayonnaise to a tuna fish sandwich. And when I got up to Danbury, I called uh, back to Norwalk. I talked to Bill Hollis, who runs the bakery in Delhi, and I said, Bill, I said, look, um, how many of these packets of mayonnaise do we give away every week? He said, 3,000. I said, how much do they cost? He said, oh, about a nickel each. He said, you mean that's $150 every week that we give away in mayonnaise? I said, you know, I'm throwing mine in the trash right now. I said, Bill, let's not include the mayonnaise in with the tuna fish sandwiches anymore. You know what he said to me? Okay, Stu. You know, that, that, that's a pretty good organizational chart right there. You know? uh, they, they teach that in school, you know? 
Uh, so about a week later, I'm driving back up to Danbury. I rush, I grab another tuna fish sandwich. I'm in my Jeep. I pop open the container and I'm eating it. And I look over, guess what I find on my seat? <laughs> a couple packets of Hellman's mayonnaise. <laughs> now I'm pissed. <laughs> I am. Oh man. <laughs> when I get a hold of Bill, you know. Uh, I, I couldn't wait. I get to the phone. I call Bill up. I said, Bill, what's going on with the, you know, don't you remember I asked no mayonnaise? He said, yes, Stu. He said, but you're going to have to talk to Mary Ekstrand, who makes the sandwiches in the deli. <laughs> so I'm thinking, you know, you chicken. You know, you. <laughs> he, he transfers me down to Mary. <clears throat> I said to Mary, I said, Mary, did you hear I didn't want any mayonnaise included with the sandwich? She said, yes, Stu, I did. And, <laughs> and, yeah, and so I, I, I said, well, I just ate a sandwich. I saw two packets of mayonnaise in it. And she said, yes, Stu. She said, you know what? I tried it your way for a few days. <clears throat> she said, but so many customers started coming up to me and asking me to include the mayonnaise that I decided to start including mayonnaise with the tuna fish sandwiches again. And I thought for a second, and I said, bravo, Mary. <clears throat> bravo. <clears throat> I mean, it, th that's what we want to have happen at the store. You know, I said to her, listen to me once in a while, you know. But <clears throat> we also... <laughs> when we talk to our cashiers, you know what we tell them? I mean, you heard what a big difference that made to Joe. You know, don't go through this big check cashing form. The guys, people show up at our cash registers with no money on them. It happens. They run at women, use different purses. They leave their wallet in the other purse or some. Husbands come in on Sunday mornings. They leave their wallet at home on the dresser. Husbands rip the last check out of their wife's checkbook without telling them, you know. <clears throat> And people get up to the registers with no money. When we talk to our cashiers and what we tell our cashiers at the store, use your judgment. They handle thousands of customers a week. They get a feel for who's good customers, who's not good customers. Use your judgment. If you're a little nervous about it, call a team leader or supervisor over to help you. But, but try to let them leave without paying. Right now, we let about 50 customers a week leave without paying. You know, we <laughs> get their name and address, you know, <laughs> from them. But, but we let them leave without paying. You know how many times we, we, people have not come back and paid us? Zero. We have a 100% batting average on that. No one has ever not returned to pay after you let them leave. And you know what they all say when they come back? I'm yours for life. <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> we'll, take the, we'll take the risk. And you know, one of the things, we had to figure this out. We never knew it before. We had to figure it out for the Malcolm Baldrige Award that less than two-tenths of one percent of our total sales are given back to customers, whatever they want, you know? Two-tenths of one-tenth of a percent. I mean, I don't know what really that number that comes out to be, but that is small, you know? <clears throat> so we're very generous. Rule one, rule two, give the customer what they want. And, and, but it, it comes out because hopefully the quality is good on the shelf so people don't have to return product. And that's sort of the whole idea right at the store. Um, Tom Peters uh, comes in and, <clears throat> uh, you know, walks through the store one night, takes a bunch of pictures and stuff. Jack Tierney, a senior VP at Pepperidge Farm, calls me, says, I'm at the American Baking Institute convention in San Francisco. He said, Tom Peters just showed a picture of your store and started talking about it. We're like, unbelievable. We can't, how did that happen? So we called Tom up and invited him into the store to walk all around. And, and we showed him all through the store. And, and uh, he didn't say much. Like he. he he really didn't get that excited about the displays and, you know, all that stuff. 
And we're standing at the end of the store, and I was dying to ask. I said, Mr. Peters, what impressed you the most about your visit to the store? You know what he said? The rock. <clears throat> I said, you mean the rule one customers always write rule two? He said, that is so important today. So competitive. You have to make the customer right. And he leaves. I walk back in the store. About six managers jump me, literally. What did he think? What did he think? I said, you know, I hate to tell you, he, he didn't like do any backflip when he went by that big tomato display you guys worked so hard on. I said, you know what? He went crazy as the rock. And Mike Derivan, our meat manager, said something I'll never forget. He said, you know, Stu, that's the one item at Stu Leonard's that we don't even sell. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> we're, we're looking for new items all the time. So what we did, we found a small specialty house about 15 miles in Stanford, Connecticut from us. And we called the fellow Murray Rackoff. He you know, measures the rock, and he makes a little prototype of it. And I, I have what that little rock looks like. Here's, here's a picture of it right here. <clears throat> and what we did was we sent one to Tom Peters. And we said, what do you think? You remember that rock? Boy, we were quick. Boy, look at this. We got this prototype. Here it is. What do you think? You know what he writes back? Send me 100 rocks as soon as you get them made. I'm like, wow, what an item. <laughs> Woo! <clears throat> <laughs> I mean, this is better than a computer business. I mean, we don't even have these things made and we've already sold some, you know? <laughs> and, <laughs> so, so I get Murray and I said, Murray, now we are in a major rush here. I want these rocks. How quick can you get them made? And he said, Stu, I could get them made quick. He said, but first you got to tell me how many you want. And I said, Murray, Look, it's a new item. Let's order 500. To, I'll run it up the flagpole, see how they sell in the store. If it's a hot item, I'll quick reorder from you. And if they don't sell, I'll just let them run out. He said, Stu, first of all, 500. I don't even know if I can make that small amount because this is a custom mold, custom material, custom everything. He said, and they cost like $20 a piece if you, if you only wanted 500. I said, $20 for a rock? I mean, are you, really? Are you kidding me? He said, no, 20 bucks. I said, Murray, I got to get a better price. I mean, I can't sell rocks, you know, $20 next to milk, 95 cents a half gallon, you know? <laughs> so he said, he said, Stu, I can get them to you for a little under $10 if you order 5000 now, I get excited, you know, with new product. I figured it was a home run item and everything. I said, I, I, I'm thinking, geez, 5,000, that's only 10 times more than 500. You know, it's not that bad. I signed the purchase order. He takes off. The day comes when the rocks arrive at the store. And I want to tell you, I'm excited. I went down and helped build this display in the store myself. This item has my name all over it, you know, like my item. You know, I'm thinking mail order. Boy, I'm, boy these things are going to sell great. Nice thing, they're not perishable. You know, they don't go bad. You can, you, you know. So we put these in the store, Miniature Rocks, $9.95. Now, how many people here think that this would have been a home run sales item? I mean, everybody's the best salesman in the room here. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> Sharp group. <laughs> you know, I wish I'd talked to you before I ordered 5,000 of these. <laughs> I mean, these didn't sell slow. They sold like, no. <laughs> I'm there. Oh, my gosh. What am I going to do? I'm moving the display around the store because sometimes it helps, you know, if you put items next to other association, you know, and it didn't work. And, and I'm, I'm really getting nervous now. And, and uh, you know, I go for a coffee in the cafeteria, and I see some managers, and they say, hey, Stu, we just figured it out. You've got 17.8 years of rock inventory left, you know? <laughs> you know? I mean, now I'm going down in flames here, you know? I, I picked a terrible item, and so I figured what I'd do, I learned this as a young kid in building displays and retailing, is that if you get stuck with an item, there's always a sign you can put up that works like magic. And this is what it is. Buy two, get one free. 
You know, <laughs> when I put this sign up in front of the rocks, I learned for sure a lifelong lesson in sales and marketing that I will never forget. If customers don't want one, then they don't want three. <laughs> <laughs> we have a suggestion box in the store we get a hundred suggestions a day in this thing by 10 o'clock in the morning we have every suggestion typed and categorized by department we make 40 photocopies in each store and we hand them out all over to all the managers we lay stacks of them on the lunchroom table I mean, here's what our, our customer suggestions will look like. They're all types. So what the idea, what we want is everybody be reading these notes and write down, here's one, keep the fish department open later. You know, we close our fish department at 8 o'clock at night. Here's a customer who's in at 8.30, wants it open later. Talked to the fish manager. He said, you know, with daylight savings time now, and he said, that's a good idea. Our fish department's open till 9 now. All notes, the customers are checking you out every single day. They're telling you things that you like and things that you don't like. One customer wrote in, this was a wild idea, but it shows what just listen and react to customers, what can do. Lady writes in, she said, I've always wasted my corn muffins because I ate only the tops and tossed the bottoms out. Have you ever thought of selling only the corn muffin tops? <laughs> now, Zita, who runs our bakery, read this note one day, and she got thinking with a few of the other team people in the bakery, and she's saying, hmm, she said, you know, maybe instead of using a muffin pan, she said, if I just use a flat pan like you do a pancake on, what if I just poured the corn muffin batter on the flat pan and I made like little corn muffin pancakes. And so she tried it the next day, and she put a big sign up, new, a customer's idea, corn muffin tops. You know? Guess what the best selling muffin is at the store? <clears throat> you know, I was walking through the bakery one day, a customer grabbed me, she was over by the corn muffin tops, ready to buy one, and she looked at me, she said, you know, I'm real concerned about supermarkets that waste food. She said, could you do me a favor? And I said, yeah. She said, could you tell me what do you do with the bottoms? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Um, another thing a customer said when she came up, she said, you know, I hate your fish. And, and, and Nick, uh, who orders all her fish, she said, ma'am, when's the last time you bought it? She said, I've never bought my fish from Stu Leonard's. And he said, well, if you've never bought it, how do you know you don't like it? And she said, the package, foam boat, plastic wrap, never do I buy my fish that way. And Nick said, well, how do you buy it? And she said, off the crushed ice at a little Italian deli, a uh, uh, fish store near my house. And so we didn't sell fish on ice at the time. Next morning, we get together, we're talking with her, what do you think, let's try fish on ice. We took, built a plywood fish bin you know, lined it with plastic, put a hostess in the store. Next to our packaged fish, we sold fish on ice. You know what happened by one o'clock? We were wiped out of all the loose fish we had planned to sell that day. The customers had bought it all up. We had to go in the back and rip open some of the packaged <laughs> fish and put it out on the ice. We have now put in fish on ice in, in both stores now. Our fish sales in Norwalk went from 15,000 pounds to over 30,000 pounds when we did that. It came from a customer. It came from a customer. It was a great idea. Another thing, boy, if you talk to anyone in the supermarket business, they will prove to you that it's better to sell strawberries in packages. It's better to do it in packages. And, you know, we're sitting in these focus groups, customers saying, I hate buying them in packages. You know, what do you hate them? Well, they, first of all, they ask, how, how long does it take you to train one of your people to hide a bruised one? You know, right in the middle <laughs> of the thing. <laughs> well, how do you buy them? How do you buy your strawberries? We buy them loose. We buy them loose. So 
So we talked to Dave Peden, runs the produce. He said, hey, Dave, what do you think, loose strawberries? Yeah, I don't think that's going to work. Why? He said, well, what's going to prevent customers just from eating them right off the strawberry stand, you know, as they're shopping? He said, they're going to have to be weighed and paid for at the registers. We have a saying at the store, let's try it for a week. Let's try it. We have a policy. We think it's screwed up. Let's get rid of it for a week and see what happens. So let's try it for a week. We said that to Dave. We went loose strawberries in the store right here. Our strawberries didn't go up like 10, 20, 30 percent in sales. They tripled. They tripled by going loose. You know, so did our shrink. You know, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> customers eating them, that tripled too, you know. But when you were all done, I mean, it was a win-win. So customers were eating a couple at the display, but we like said to everybody, look, don't look at it like they're stealing, they're tasting, you know? <clears throat> so <laughs> so we're, ha we're happy, the customers are happy, they're buying big bags of strawberries, we're going along. It only bothered one person at the store, Julius, who's in charge of all our traffic control and security at the store. He comes up to me, just about ready to blow through the roof, he was so mad. And I said, I tried to calm him down. I said, Jules, what's the matter? He said, Stu, I was walking, making my rounds. I was walking through the produce department. He said, there was a customer who walked over, took two gigantic handfuls of strawberries, walked over to her two shopping carts that were filled with kids, and just started handing them out to all her kids like they were snacks or something. He said, I walked over. I said, ma'am, I'm sorry. You're not allowed to eat the strawberries like that until they're weighed and paid for at the register. And I said, Jules, what are you so mad about? I said, I, I, I think you handled that perfectly. And he looked back, he said, do you know what she said, said to me? And I said, what? He said, she told me to go read The Rock at the front door. <laughs> One of the things we always try to keep remembering is we've got to Keep the wow, the excitement. You know, we're in the retail business. You, people like to get excited. That's why Disney's so full over here. They like fun kids type stuff. So we try to make our store fun. We want the customers to say, wow, here's one thing we do. We have these costume characters walking around. Cow, duck, and ch chicken. You know, we want a customer to be pushing their shop, go, wow, a cow, you know, or something. <laughs> We, we want to we wanna get them excited and get that wow. Don Soderquist, you know, vice chairman of Walmart, came in to see the store one day. So I said to him, I know how you're watching expenses. I said, I'll pick you up at the airport. You know how I picked him up at LaGuardia Airport in New York? Dressed as a cow, you know? <laughs> he, he got off the plane with his briefcase. You know what he said? Wow. <clears throat> You know, here's a button you push at the store. You push a button, the cow head goes up, moo, like that. It's right over our milk. This is my daughter Blake here, by the way. But the idea, kid, yeah, kids love, I'm teaching her the retail business. She, when she walks around the store with me, I have her looking up in the display cases to see if any light bulbs are burned out. You know, <laughs> that's important. You know, you can't sell if the product's not well lit. But, but she loves this little moo cow button. Some people say, you know, cow, oh, that's kid stuff, little kids like that. We showed Barbara Bush through the store. She pushed this button five times. <laughs> we have a short little poem. It doesn't even match some of the great poems, you know, you guys have written out here. <clears throat> but it just goes, satisfy is what we do we believe in this rule one and two. And wow is what we want our customers to say. And if all of you say wow, you'll make my day. Wow! <laughs> that is great. I had a ball being with you. Thank you so much. Thanks a million. All right, yeah, thank you. <laughs> you know what I got to do? Hold on. I got to get a picture. <laughs> Oh boy. Hey, thanks a lot. Thank you very much. <laughs>